it was where there is no heart, there is no art. And I thought that was like, it's, it's simple, but it's, it's, it's real. You know, it's like, you know, if knowing you're doing and creating for, for the right intentions and for the right, you know, for yourself and is, is so important. And you, you know, like you just, especially now with social media, just everyone's just out there just like, look at me, look at me, you know, and it's like, where, where's the heart in that, you know, and it's Welcome to episode six of the Enculturation Podcast, where we aim to make learning about the world fun, engaging, and accessible. Today, we have Amy Tsunami Ferreira, a Bay Area native that has traveled the world as a professional dancer and movement artist for decades and is multifaceted artist of fine arts as well. Constantly exploring new places through her travel, she has always been intrigued with the details of architecture, fashion, costume design, and visual arts through dance. She has performed and shared her passions and found balance through these mediums for the past 30 plus years. Some of her achievements include associate's degree from FIDM, visual merchandising, architecture degree from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, senior project manager with one of Silicon Valley's premier architecture firms, and former national champion in classical ballet and lyrical jazz, bronze medalist, national and world titles in artistic roller skating. She's a co-creator of Get Down Dolls and All Women, All Styles Los Angeles Dance Group principal dancer for a touring theater show titled Break, the Urban Funk Spectacular. Associated with highly acclaimed dance groups such as Philology, Circle of Fire, Soul Shifters, and Movement Studio with highlight performances for the People's Party, Malcolm X Jazz Festival, Crucible Fire Arts Festival, and Cypher Culture Conference. As a cultural diplomat and educator, she nurtures and supports the club culture and freestyle dance movement locally and worldwide through performing, teaching, judging competitions, mentoring, and co produce events such as R16, USA, All the Way Live, and Bay Area House Dance Festival. In 2019, Tsunami founded Her Principles, Honor, Empower, Respect, to promote accountability, awareness, and provide a network of support for women within the hip hop and urban dance communities. As a visual artist, she utilizes her hands and imagination through drawing, painting, sewing, and sculpting. Tsunami becomes hyper-focused in her creative outlets and enjoys the process even more so than the final product by exploring new materials and methods of creativity. Tsunami Originals started in 2015 where she began to do commission work ranging from custom painted instruments, shoes, large scale murals, and costumes. Recipient of the 2017 Alameda County Arts Leadership Award and has displayed her artwork at the San Jose Museum of Art two solo exhibitions at Movement Studio in Berkeley, California. Welcome, Amy, to the show. Hi. <laughs> I was like, didn't realize how long that was. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I feel like this this episode, I hope to uh, dive into your process and and dissect it and, and break it down for others, including myself, to learn more about, you know. Uh, I, I, I actually didn't realize how much I didn't know you <laughs> <laughs> or, or the extent of what you do until pretty much this episode, because, or I, I think more so in recent years where I, I started like um, expanding my views on other things, right? Because for a while, when I first got into dance, I was like, house dance, house just, dance, just, just, house just dance. so, yeah. you know, and it, which is great because yeah. I, I, I love being laser focused, but now, now I'm more like a flashlight or a little lantern mm -hmm. where, you know, where I'm not so uh, hyper focused. I'm like, wow, Amy's done so much like amazing work <laughs> where, I am genuinely excited and curious how you do it just because you don't just do these things casually. You do these things to a high damn level of <laughs> excellence, you know? Our, my motto or my crew's motto, you know, we kind of joke, we're like, never half ass, only full ass. <laughs> you know, like, but how many full asses do you have? <laughs> a lot of ass. <laughs> Fortunately, not that <back> <laughs> No, but yeah, we, we go full out. <laughs> Let's start out with like little, little fun facts and achievements, you know? Mm -hmm. What are some fun facts and achievements you had over the years? Um, well, you mentioned the the Leadership Award was actually really cool for, for here in the Bay Area. Um, that was primarily based off of a mural and some of the community work that I had done um, through the All The Way Live organization or foundation. Um, let's see, some of the... The other achievements that I've done. I mean, as far as art, or we're, mm -hmm. talk, we're talking all the things that I like to do, or uh, just 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 something that like 
that's that you feel is uh, interesting that maybe not a lot of people know about you. Like, hey, well, actually, I think I think at this point, I don't know a lot about you, <laughs> so that's all. That's all good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like the artistic roller skating. You know, that was many many lives ago. But uh-huh. you know, being you know, at, in a, as a teenager, um, a national you know level and an international level, you know champion or you know bronze medalist and w- the were, top you, three. were you also a figure skater as well it well so i was raised as a r- artistic roller skater which is exactly like figure skating on ice but uh-huh. on quads okay and so my mom was a roller a national champion roller skater as well so um it I, runs in the family it runs in the family a lot of it roots from my mom and my grandmother actually a lot of the creativity side um but yeah, so she, when she was competing, I was in the rink, and then I started competing, and you know, just kind of transferred through. And you know, a lot of a lot of the the artistic traits that I have, um, she was also a costume designer and seamstress artist. You know, she was a multifaceted artist in many ways, and the best of the best. You know, so I had a lot to look up to and try to you know make make myself follow in her footsteps in that respect and. Same with my grandmother. She's a master oil painter, you know, an amazing carpenter. And, you know, so I helped build things with her and, you know, watch her paint, you know, oil paintings of the ocean and the sky. And, you know, it looks like a photograph because it's just so realistic and how amazing she was, but, or is still painting. (laughs) So, yeah. Um, But as far as any other achievements, I mean, you know, just through, you know, taking myself through school and, and getting an architecture degree and, you know, being, you know, in one of the top firms and, and being able to financially be stable through that to allow my other achievements or my other passions, you know, to, to provide, you know, financially for all my toys and travels and, you know, supplies and stuff. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's a huge achievement because, you know, when I graduated or got out of high school, like I was hot mess, you know, and could easily have gone down the wrong path within the rave scene and, you know, and could have been all bad. And luckily I was able to stray from that and, you know, really put my nose to the ground and get, get through school and, and, you know, find some cool, cool places to work and do some really creative things through that as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really big achievement because my family was like, Oh no, Amy's gonna. <laughs> we don't know where she's gonna end up, but we'll see, you know. And finally, you know, kind of figured it out on my own. And everyone was like, "Okay, she did it," <laughs> you know. Like, you, 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 I, I think, I think you more than did it. You definitely did a lot of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, I, th- I think a lot of it, like the self determination aspect of things, you know, like, you know, I, I, I had a complicated upbringing. Um, as, as amazing as, as my mom and as talented as she was, she also had her struggles, um, drug problems and such, you know, like it was the 80s. Like who doesn't, you know, or do who didn't have a problem, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, part, uh, it's part of the 80s starter kid. It, yeah, <laughs> literally. And, you know, so it was, it was really like learning what not to do from her in ways to survive, you know? And so it was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta do follow some of the the things that she was so, you know, like perfectionist and OCD about, but then also f- fo- not follow the things that she was just a disaster with, you know? And so I really kind of had those things like constantly on in the back of my head, like, okay, I can't fall into these, these, these pockets of, of trauma or whatever. Like I have to push through this to survive. And so that, that, that translated through my dance, through my art, through just relationships, through like just everything as a whole. Mm-hmm. For for anyone um, who is already familiar with Amy as the dancer, there is a great um, episode she did with I think Beyond the Dance, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, Beyond the yeah. Dance. So so if you're, you guys are looking to um, understand more of Amy's past and history uh, from a dance perspective, check that out, right? Uh, for this one, we're looking to unpack like all, just her as a creative being and her as a creative process, which dance is, is part of that, but yeah. we're not gonna focus pre on that, right? Right. And, and um, just because I think that this part of you is just as equally as, as amazing mm. uh, and that should be unpacked. So um, yeah, let's start with your creative process. 
Uh, is that something that you have formulated through the years, through like trials and errors, or did, um, as you mentioned, your mom pass on any like strategies uh, yeah. to you regarding that? I mean, it's it's there's so many parts to it. When I was thinking of this question ahead of time, I was kind of like, okay, well, s some of it is you know kind of um, pre or premeditated in ways. Others is it's kind of on the fly. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the things, you know, that I, the way that I see the process is problem solving. Um, I apply that to my architecture work. I apply it to my, my costume designs. I apply it to, you know, skating and every, dance, every, all of it, all kind of in some ways is problem solving to me. So, um, I tend to kind of get into this tunnel vision where like that's the only thing this one one piece or something that I want to dive into whether it's a painting or you know a, a mask or whatever I tend to just really start to dive in and start researching materials methods you know things other other pieces that may of, of similar work that may inspire me um and and also um music is a huge piece for me um, to apply or to kind of get into my process. Um, you know, I tend to see or visualize a lot of times. I think it's, it's what is it? Synesthesiology or... Synesthesia? Synesthesia, there it is. is, is are you talking about that thing where um, your senses kind of like mix and match? Because I've, I've heard some, and my understanding of synesthesia is not very high, so, but just what I know mm -hmm. is like sometimes you can you can feel what you see or you can yeah, smell what to, you see. I tend yeah. to see, you yeah. know, colors and, and shapes and things. And it's not like all of a sudden there's a triangle going past me, you know, <laughs> like, but I can definitely like just visualize movement and, and colors and stuff. And so I tend to apply that and that initially, like that's really how I started to kind of relay into the, the ribbons of light that I I'm kind of known for now for with my Tsunami Originals artwork stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I just, as far as just diving in, you know, I love exploring like new mediums and, and again, the challenges of trying to figure something out, you know, like today I want to sculpt. Well, how, how do I really like, what tools do I need? Like, how am I going to really dig into this? And then once I start to get it to a place where I, I, I'm happy with it, it's like, okay, well now I got to figure out how to make a mold because I'm going to make, I want to make multiples of these, you know, like, what do I do with that? I'm going to buy a degassing chamber and do this, you know, and like we have this running joke at home because it's just like, who has a degassing chamber in their house? You know, <laughs> like what, you know, like, little things like that. Like, oh, today I bought a table saw, you know, like, it's just like, you know, and it kind of depends on. So, on so, so definitely not going to your neighbor and borrowing a cup of sugar. It's like, no, I'm like, <laughs> Hey, do you have any epoxies or you know, like, just the most random things? But but trying to like figure out the, the tools and you know how to get from start to finish. Um, so so would it be fair to say that like you have the idea or the vision, and then that kind of nav navigates you to figure out like how to get there, even if you don't know how to get there yet. Like for example, whether it's like making a new sculpture. Okay, you want to make a sculpture, you have an idea for what the sculpture should be, but maybe you don't know how to make it. And so you start just... Just, yeah, I just dive in, you know, and, you know, whether it's, you know, like a, a lot of the projects, especially like during um, quarantine, like I was really trying to explore completely new materials that I'd never used before, but had seen something and was like, yo, I, I want to do that, you know, I want to try this and kind of get out of that safe zone of just painting on an iPad or on a canvas or wood panel or a wall, you know, just more, more hands-on stuff. Like I love being covered in paint. Like I'm a messy worker, you know, it's like lock me in my room, get high off the fumes and be covered in paint and I'm happy. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So. Did, did, did you bring, um, I think you brought some pieces. Did you bring any pieces that came out of that um, whole COVID process? Actually, yeah, this this mask um, was part of that process. Okay. Um, and that was one of the sculpture ones actually where I just was decided I'm gonna get a block of clay, I'm gonna sculpt a mask and you know, this idea of this firebird kind of- Have you sculpted mind. before? Or is, is it your first time sculpting? Um, I, scul I sculpted if probably like 15 years ago. And like I used to- I And this is the, the next time you did yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I probably when I, I lived in New York when I was going to architecture school and um, I was dating a sculpture sculptor and um, he, you know, had access to all kinds of amazing materials at that time. So I can, can I touch learned, this? Yeah, yeah. I learned to, um, you know, I was making actually marionettes and sculpting the, it's okay. It's, don't worry about that. <laughs> I did that earlier. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> he broke it. <laughs> no. But I, oh, you know, this, I learned, I learned to, um, you know, learn some, some techniques and stuff. The, the detail on this is like that's, really good. That's where I geek out though, is like within the details, it's, you know, talking of process, it's within those details of figuring out how to really create something to come to life mm -hmm. is where I find the most peace. <laughs> like if that makes any sense, you know, like I'm at the most calmest state in my mind when I'm working on something like that detailed. By, by calm, like, like, can you help uh, me understand what is it like to not be calm? Is it like you got, you have too many ideas that's running or you have a lot of back burner thoughts and this helps you focus? Yeah, I I mean, I, I battle with anxiety, you know, about just a, a lot of different things. And so sitting down and, and drawing or sculpting or, you know, whatever the project is, sewing mm -hmm. or whatever, um, you know, it tends to kind of put some of those louder voices in the back mm -hmm. and, you know, let myself still process, you know, the, the situations or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in the foreground, it's just a lot quieter. And this is really good, though. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, like, can you walk us through like you, you had a block of clay? Yep. This is obviously not a block of clay anymore. Now, no. now it's the actual piece. Like, yeah. how, how did you go from block of clay into this? So. I actually used kind of like just like a little template like of a, a regular mask, mm -hmm. just like a, a you know paper ca Halloween mask that you would normally just grab for a masquerade or something. Yeah, um, and kind of made a form for it and started to just block out the clay and just start breaking it down and working it out. And then you know you you go through la different layers of of working the clay because it's it'll the the clay that I use is. Fairly soft, but if it's cold, it'll it'll get a lot harder. So you can do a lot of the more the the finer details and things. Mm -hmm. um, is it gonna stay? <laughs> stay, bird, stay. <laughs> so, um, you know, and so once 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 you get the the sculpt done, um, I have to make a mold so you I did like a I think I did a two-part mold on this and it's actually kind of adding like a another layer of um, like a liquid kind of plastic that dries really fast and or like a, it's like a rubber for the most part so you pour that and then you can peel that off and then you have the negative of the mask and so from there, then you apply and create like a, it's a two part like liquid plastic, basically slightly toxic in some ways, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, you pour that down, you mix it up and it cures super fast. So you have to pour it into the mold and kind of swish it around and like try to get it to be even and lay, you know, layered up fairly quick and not too heavy, you know, or too thick. Have, have you ever done any um, like time lapse or how to, how to videos? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've done. Actually, I did some on that. This this I ended up turning this into a full costume after I made this one. Um, I poured another mold of of the mask, and then I ended up doing this whole Firebird flamed headpiece and wings, and <laughs> so I wore it for a Halloween event. Um, I think that was twenty nineteen. We did. We went to a Halloween boat party. And I went as this phoenix and full wings and full costume. No, and it was fun because I had it um, the the mask I could just pull off mm -hmm. and still have like the whole fire piece headpiece because no one no one knew who I was. They're like, <laughs> who is that? And I'd be like, ta-da! <laughs> so it was super fun. This but is yeah. burned luck. <laughs> and that you know, as far as the process and like, I I love part of my process is to go back and look and see what I how where and how I did to get where I'm at, like, if that makes sense, like, like every day that I make some progress on something, I'll take pictures of it. And then, you know, when I go to bed, I'll just sit there and look at the pictures and, okay, well, I need to, I need to fix this, or I want to fix this, or maybe I could add, you know, and keep, keep the ideas coming and, and, and kind of 
things moving still. And then the next day when I go back in, I ha I feel like there's another big stride of of like so 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 you so you're constant constantly reviewing and critiquing and analyzing your own work and your own progress. Yeah. So so it's there's there's a lot of like understanding and um, takeaways and lessons learned from from what you're doing, even like day to day or week to week or project to project. Yeah. 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 I, you know, the, the time lapses are really fun. Um, but it's really like just being able to kind of take a few pictures and just, I'll be at work and just kind of look over and be like, okay, I need to fix that. You know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it, again, it gets, becomes tunnel vision and I'll go from work, go home and go into the studio and just start, go, you know, going to work till 2am or whatever. And, you know, and, and just try to, get things to be where they're cool and yeah complete you know i i really admire that um space that you're talking about the tunnel vision you know i i, I would call it the flow state mm -hmm. where there, there's been times when no matter what the topic was or what i'm around i i could never reach out to place yeah. and i was like this sucks i can't you know that nothing excites me nothing inspires me yeah. but when 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 you do reach it you're like oh it's back it's there here it is. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah 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 totally yeah that's the bird well uh Let's talk about the, the other piece you brought. Let's talk about the, the dragon. Okay. Yeah. You want me to grab him? Yeah, grab him. <laughs> Our neighborhood uh, dragon. So, guys, get ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> that is so damn legit. Thanks. Like, this is some serious stuff. This is, like, like high level, you know? Yeah, he's. this is my buddy. <laughs> so, so right here is, um, you took a piece of clay and this came out. Yeah. So like. So this is this is foam. Okay. It's a, a EVA foam. Um, it's basically what gym mats are made out of. Like those little puzzle looking squares. Oh, okay. That, like at kids playgrounds yeah. and stuff. Is that, is that what you use? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the material. It comes in different thicknesses. Mm -hmm. um, and you can apply, uh, use a heat gun to to help shape it. It changes the property of the material, and you can actually see it change. It's pretty wild, um, but you can um, be you can mold it and shape it once it's heated up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you have to like use like a um, like an epoxy sealer. Um, what's it? I forget what it's called. Um, something plastic dip, and um, and then you can paint it. Otherwise, it'll just get absorbed. You, you know what this feels like with uh, you here being, or sh showcasing me all this? It, it feels like a behind the scenes of a Hollywood movie set where they talk, they talk, <laughs> they talk about the props, you know, like how, how it was made. I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was in high school, I always, I thought it would be um, really cool to be a, like a set designer mm -hmm. and, you know, Jim Henson and the Muppets. Were, have always been one of like a big inspiration, like Labyrinth and these, you know, all the Muppets and the characters and puppets and stuff. Like those have always been such an influence to me, like just in just being creative, not necessarily like trying to recreate puppets or anything, but mm -hmm. just how out there things are, the ideas are, the characters are. And so, um, you know, diving into these. Is that fascinating? I, 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 I wonder if uh, any of uh, anyone involved with the Muppets can ever or has like imagined like, oh yeah, we inspired this person to make a dragon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how cool, how cool is that? I know, right? <laughs> so I'm like, like, big uh, ups to what, Jim. <laughs> what, did you do foam work before or is this also another like first time project um, thing? Well, my, this was probably my second or third project. <laughs> Uh, my first one actually was a, it was an all out one and it was a cyborg costume where I did like a full armored ch chest plate and full helmet, like totally out there. Um, like I, I, I get that either it's the first one or the second one, but like, how is it so good for a first or second, third time? Is, is this, is, well, you know, like, I mean, <laughs> I mess up. I for sure mess up. Trust me. Like, and that's, you know, part of the problem solving. It's yeah. like, I don't see things as failures. I feel, I see them as learning lessons, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. okay, damn, this doesn't work. So what do I got to do to change it? So this guy, I actually, I started with, I made like a small clay maquette, like the general idea of the shape of the, the dragon head and what that was going to look like. So I had that little mini model as my, my, my vision because I have a really hard time keeping a sketchbook. It's the weirdest thing. I have to have, if I start drawing something, it has to be a finished piece. <laughs> like I can't just throw down ideas. I've been working on it. I've been slowly doing, especially on like my iPad type drawings, like doing some some like 
collage pieces of where I'm sketching and bringing in inspiration photos and kind of making like an image board type thing. Mm -hmm. But um, that one I actually did like an actual sculpture, a little tiny guy. I was like, okay, this is going to be my dragon. And then I started making one fuller scale, thinking measured off my hand and kind of thinking, okay, well, if I'm holding my arm up, like this is where he, he's going to be, like what's that going to look like? And I made one, I spent like a week and a half just all out on this thing and he's huge and he's kind of retarded and his jaw doesn't really function. He's, he's our special dragon, you know? <laughs> and so I was realized how big he was and out of scale and for, for my own body of being the dragon body and... I was like, yeah, this thing's heavy. My arm's going to fall off. And so, okay, now I need to really figure out some of the mechanics of the jaw, weight, you know, like size and scale and things like that. So then I went into this guy. So that was that was the second one. <laughs> so, I'm so mad at you. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh. <laughs> can, can, you, can, any, can anyone believe that this is her second attempt? This is, this is insane. Like, I... Uh, <laughs> And I, I want to promise you and guarantee that I'm not easily impressed. And and my friends know this about, about me because sometimes you're like, oh, yeah, what do you think of this? And I'll be, I'll be very quiet. Like, like, oh, that's cute. And, and, they're, and they're like, damn, he doesn't like it, you know? <laughs> but, Thank you. But, but this is amazing. Like, seriously. Yeah, it was, it was a fun, fun project. I, ha I have actually on my Instagram some time-lapse videos oh, okay. of making the head, making the full body to the full costume and everything. So there's there's a couple videos. On yeah, I, I like how like um, you apply creativity, but also like a lot of logic to to what you do, mm -hmm. you know, um, like the, the shaping or the mechanics or like the physics of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it comes from the architecture brain, you know, side of stuff. I don't know. But do, do, do you like lean on one or the other or are they in harmony or does, does one overtake the other? Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> like like, I mean, like like me for example, I've um have never really considered myself an artist, but then I realized at one point that was like like a, a self limiting belief, you know? Mm. Yeah, and then I was like, wait a minute, maybe I can just try it out and, and just see where it goes. And yeah. then so for for most of my life, um, the 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 logic side has been really strong, mm -hmm. and just more recently, I'm learning how to like balance the two. So yeah. what, what's yeah. like what's been your process with that? Um, you know, I, I th the thing that popped to mind is in architecture school, um, the the logic or the more practical side of things was what I wanted to learn. You know, like I want I wanted to learn how to build a building. When I graduate, I want to be able to go out and make something stand, you know, and like someone live in. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was so interesting because in the program, everything was so, all, everybody's designs were so organic and just so abstract conceptually that I'm like, how the hell are you going to make that stand? You, you know, <laughs> do you know how that would work? Like that, that's not going to work, you know structurally or you know and people are like oh no but the the concept you know and this and that i'm just like yeah but ain't nobody gonna get in there like you know and so i always come with insurance I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i always had this struggle of the practicality side um versus this just more freer artistic side and so i feel like that's kind of now this like this the artistic's brain you know kind of gets released more but the practical side still kind of is over there like well maybe you could try this and sometimes it kind of hinders me and i get too rigid with a project or you know an idea and you know like Co cody will come in and just be like no you should try this <laughs> you know just be like but that's that's very different, you know, and I have to kind of like mull over or something like, well, maybe I can try that, you know, and so it'll work or, you know, just having something from out the other side, the critical thinker. Do you, you feel like the, the, the practical side like demands creativity because now you're like taking this idea and then you're applying practicality to it because, because I think, um, like in the example of the homes, right? Like, yeah, these concept homes are great, but, but if, if they can't stand structurally, then are they really homes? Right. Or right. versus just like like a concept, right? Yeah. 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 So I, I, it, it, it kind of sounds like the practicality forces a level of creativity. Like, okay, how can I take this cool idea, but now how can I make it sustainable? How can you make it work? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think it's a huge part. I mean, if you're fully just within the practical zone, then it, it's going to just be a box. Or yeah. Like a cardboard box. Yeah. Like, canvas or you know it's just like a shipping container right yeah you know like <laughs> there it is that's that's the building you know <laughs> 
<laughs> so I, I feel like yeah, there's there's a if there's a way to 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 merge the two sides of the brain or merge those two, you know, the more artistic versus the more practical. Um, there, there's a, there is a way to, to merge the two. Um, but it's tricky. It's for sure tricky. Do, do, do you feel like um, your, your parents and or your mom and your grandma gave you an early start with, as far as the creativity? And then you were like, okay, let me just balance that with the practicality through architecture school. Is that, is that the, the flow there or is, it, is there a flow there? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, the the creativity was there. The problem solving was always there for, okay. with with them because watching my mom, you know, create a, a ro- because she did a lot of like roller skating and ballroom costumes, um, which was just like the ice skating dresses and in men's suits and stuff. And um, she was kind of like the the trendsetter of the entire skating scene. Like whatever she came out with the next year, everyone else would have that, you know, like the, the dresses or whatever. And but I would watch her, you know, like fit someone and figure out how to to drape something, how to attach something, you know, like constantly and composition and you know, like materials, like always exploring all those things. Um, and there obviously is a practical aspect of that that t- that stuff also. Can the person move in it? Can they do a jump in it? You know, like what happens if she spins? Is it going to fly off? You know, like <laughs> so. I think maybe there was some of the practical practical aspects of things when you know that I was seeing and learning from her because when she would be sewing, I'd be sitting on the ground, you know, picking up the scraps and making my own little things, you know, and like just kind of following her lead. And um, same with my grandmother. I think my grandmother was actually the more practical one in the sense that she, even though as a master painter or a master artist, um, she can re- reproduce something like nothing, like a portrait, photograph, she can recreate through oil paints or pencils or watercolors, um, like to, to, the, to the T. You can't tell the difference between a photo and her work. It's, it's wild, and I, but I mess with her. I'm like, hey grandma, like, when are you gonna get out of your box, you know? Like, when are you gonna just draw something on out of your head, you know? And she's like, oh, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know if I could do that, you know? <laughs> and so every now and then, she's 86 years old and she still sends me her pictures of her paintings and things that she's working on. And so I tried to paint this one from memory, you know? And I'm like, well, okay, you know? <laughs> so maybe she's the more practical one that I, I got some of the, that stuff from. And, mm-hmm. You know, she was a builder and carpenter, so building dance floors and, you know, studio spaces and stuff, like watching her really figure out how these things were going to work. And, you know, it was, I think it was a really beautiful dynamic of the, the two artist, artists that I looked up to, you know. Um, but the architecture school, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why. But when I got into my first program, I was just like, y'all are going to graduate and not know how to do to, to build anything like I'm not okay with this. And that's why I ended up transferring to a different school <laughs> in hopes that I might find that, you know, in the programs. But I, so, so like, uh, what other fields did you consider, um, besides architecture or, or I, I guess what made you choose architecture of, of all things was it just accessibility or because your grandma was a carpenter. So there's like a transfer there. Yeah. So I, when I got out of high school, I got into FITM and just because I didn't have my shit together, you know, and I was like, trade school, I can go there, yay. Um, and I ma- majored in visual merchandising, which is basically store window displays, mannequins, you know, like Macy's Christmas cr- Christmas windows on the street, you know, and or in, just the decorations within inside a, a, a store. And that's that's really cool. I I, I see like uh, how it you know it, it evolved from managing the uh, window displays into making these displays yourself or making yeah. costumes, yeah. That's yeah, really and, cool. that, and that was the thing. It was when I was in that program, I, I it was a two-year program, and I got almost all the way through the whole thing, and I just was taking a drafting class and doing store planning or something, and that was my first time ever drafting. And I it was it just kind of hit me like, man, I don't want to just decorate this stuff. I want to actually create the space that these that people are going to or being, or, you know, you know, experiencing. Um, so it was it it kind of clicked then, but I didn't didn't pursue it at all yet. Um, after that, I kind of fell into the dance party world and <laughs> just like I said earlier, hot mess. <laughs> um, 
And it wasn't until my good friend's father actually, he pulled me aside one time. He was like, I want to see your portfolio. Bring, bring me, you know, bring your work next time you come over. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, so I brought over my portfolio and we sat down at the kitchen table and he looked through all my projects and my work and, you know, I had some like fine art drawings as well as architecture st type stuff or store planning stuff. And he just looked at me and was like, you need to go back to school and you need to get into either architecture or do something that you can utilize this creativity. He's like, don't waste it. Like he literally checked my ass. <laughs> and it, it shook me because I didn't really have that type of structure family wise, like my father, you know, pretty strange from him and you know my mom just was like do whatever makes you happy you know <laughs> and so it just didn't have any of that like direction or hand holding and so it took a friend's father to be like no you need to go to school you need to go now and so I was just like okay well what am I gonna do you know and and then I started realizing all through my years of of dance comp competing skating competitions and traveling through you know my teen years and younger years, I had photo albums of pictures, you know, back when we actually printed photos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was of each city I would travel to. And it wasn't about, it wasn't even about the skating or the dancing. It wasn't even of me and my friends or family. It was literally pictures of buildings and details of little you know, like the corner of a building or it was just so bizarre and it had never registered to me like that was a, like an, in like hardwired interest, you know? And so I was kind of like, huh, maybe I, maybe I should, sh should try architecture and see, you know, if that really like sticks with me. So I, I, I jumped over to like a junior college to take some of the classes and like, I just started, I, it, it just clicked you know, and I got an internship at a firm and I was kind of like, yeah, I could do this, you know. And and the other part of the the decision of of going into architecture was, you know, at the time I, you know, was dancing a lot um, and I was just kind of realizing, you know what, I don't think, you know, what am I going to do when my dancing body doesn't dance anymore, you know, to the potential of survival and financially being stable? Like, what am I going to do? You know, and so that's when I kind of like, yeah, maybe I need this plan B where it's still a creative outlet, but it's stable. I can do it when I'm 80. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, I can sit at a desk and design a building, you know, and and so that's when I just kind of went all in for it. And um, but I told myself I won't let the creative side of things like my art, my dance, my skating or whatever, like slip away while I was, you know, training for in architecture. So I always made sure that I found this balance between work, school, dance, and art, and just kind of always made sure there was a balance. And then when there wasn't, I would get all out, out of whack and start to kind of lose it and just be like, ah, I need to dance. I need to do something, you know, like I need to do something creative. But um, that was kind of how I, I found my way in into the architecture aspect of things. But it's an interesting, interesting route <laughs> 10 year plan of college <laughs> yeah very very amazing uh, what what's what's your approach to like um to solve problem solving or, or actually let me retract what's your what's your approach to creativity is it uh like do you ever just explore without a goal or is it usually you have this goal and then you problem solve towards that goal yeah, I mean, I usually kind of get hit with an idea, you know, and just be like, oh, I should make that, you know, like, what can I do with that, <laughs> you know, if I see something. And it, it it could be the most random thing. Like, I just watch a movie, you know, like, Fifth Element is one of my favorite all-time movies to get inspired by. Ooh. And it's not to, to, like, make something based off of that movie. It's just the creativity within that movie that always sparks me. I play that movie, like, multiple multiple times a month you know? so, so like as a creative what are the things about that movie that that sticks out to you it's 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 like the this alternate world the set designs the costuming's phenomenal um you know the, the characters are fun you know it's just i don't know there's something in ways it's like a nostalgic movie but that movie just doesn't ever get old for me like and it's just 
I don't know. They're, yeah, they're just the 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 creativity in there. Were just they just kind of were like, we have no limit. Let's just go for it. You know, like we're gonna create this diva costume and we're gonna have these you know crazy costumes and and characters and and it just it just clicks for me and kind of similar to like the Muppet, like all of the Jim Henson world, you know, like those kind of like characters and things just get my brain going and, and I could, I'll create something totally non-related, you know, but it just kind of helps get me, get me. Do, um, do, do any of your goals are ever time or investment constraint? Like for example, how long did it take you to make this, uh, these two pieces? And, and was that a factor into whether you're going to do it or not, or it's not important to you? Well, these ones, I, the only deadline I have is Halloween, and I usually start about three months early. <laughs> it's like, it's, so, let's see, August, I'm like, okay, it's Halloween, like, <laughs> it's coming, you know, what am I going to do? Um, yeah, I mean, as far as, like, my personal projects, I don't really set a time constraint, Um when I am doing a project for, a, for say, a client or, you know, someone wants to commission me for something, then it, I try to have a time constraint. Um, and then it's also I have to look and evaluate, okay, well, is this something, is this kind of like something I can do, like I'm comfortable with, it's kind of my, my, my standard groove, or is this something where I'm going to be exploring a totally new thing and diving in and just going to figure it out, you know, like for instance, I, I created the, um, for 2020, um, the Bembe music award trophy and, uh, it was for all national DJs and through Ocha records. And they were like, yeah, we want you to make a trophy. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what am I going to, how am I going to make that? You know, like what, what how am I going to do this? And then it was like, okay, well I got the idea Again, I was actually going, did a sculpture, started to make the sculpture and was like, okay, well, how many do you need? How many trophies? 13. Like, okay, when's the, when's the show? You know, <laughs> so I had to start really like trying to plan and like make a list every day of, okay, okay I got to get this done. I got to sand this. I got to sculpt this. I got to pour that, you know, and like really tried to configure. And I had some major disasters and it was just like panic mode, you know, I'm like, okay, this is going to tack on another two days to redo this. And, you know, so it's when. What's considered a major disaster in the world, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> for instance, on, well, on the, the, the trophies, I had made the sculpture. I, you know, built a box, put the, the sculpture in to pour the liquid um, rubber, basically, to make this mold. And the 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 box didn't hold and so while i'm pouring this big bucket of like liquid rubber stuff um i didn't know but it was like oozing out and dripping down the table all over the carpet all over me like everywhere and i'm like why isn't this filling up and you know i'm like looking in the box not looking at like yeah and you're like why is my feet wet <laughs> yeah and i'm like this should be like full i'm running out of material you know and i'm like starting to panic like what the hell and that's when i step back and it's just like oozing everywhere and i was just like ah Cody, you know <laughs> or like trying to like, keep the cats away you know cats licking it <laughs> yeah they were just like ready to run through it and it was just like freaked out you know and when it dries it dries hard so it was like it's in the carpet still you know and I'm like sorry <laughs> if we ever move we'll have to replace the carpet real quick but um yeah I mean it's but again I don't see that as a failure I just figure like okay that didn't work what can I do bet to better this you know and how did you like happen. develop such a uh, a healthy relationship to obstacles meaning like you you had you had this incident and you're like okay it's not it's not gonna hold me back I'm not gonna tell myself a, a negative story about it that that sounds very mature and very healthy like how did you how, how did you reach that place because I think a lot of people struggle with like oh my god this is some hardship or it's like a speed bump I'm gonna yeah. shut down or you know yeah no I mean I I definitely I do hit speed bumps I do get frustrated you know I do kind of lose hope sometimes I'm just like man I'm way in over my head you know <laughs> like how am I gonna get through this there's some there's someone waiting and expecting something from me like how am I gonna pull this together you know and it's kind of like those 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 the expectations of of someone else I'm like I can't let them down like I gotta I gotta figure this out like man up and do it you know and and that kind of sometimes gets me over the hump other times I need to literally 
step away for a day, not think about it, just go do something else, and then come back a little more refreshed and be like, okay, I got a clear head now, let's do this. And just, I don't know, like the the self-determination or perseverance or I don't know what you call it. It's just Have you always been that way? Or, or yeah. did, did, did the series of events kind of mold you? To, to I, I mean, through the level of like, training and competing through dance and skating i think that you know has had molded me in a way no pun intended uh, you know, <laughs> like, uh, had like literally been for the most part hardwired into me of you know if if you you know don't suck <laughs> you know, basically don't suck you got to figure it out you got to look good you got to make it good and sell it you know or present it and you know do it for yourself, obviously, you know, don't, don't just do it to, to please somebody else. Um, but, you know, make that achievement, you know, for yourself. And so at the end of the day, I'm like, man, that was a bitch, but I did it. You know, there's actually, I had that little note right here. Um, I have on my, all my computers at work and at home. It's this little saying, it's called the creative, creative process. Step one is this is going to be awesome. Step two, this is hard. Step three, this is horrible. Step four, I'm horrible. <laughs> Step five, that was awesome. You know, and like I I ran, my boss actually gave that to me years ago because I was stuck in a pro on a project at work and just like pulling my hair out. I was upset. I was freaking out. And he just kind of like slipped that little process note on my desk and I read it. And I was just like, okay. I'm gonna get this, you know, and put that right on my computer. I put one on my um, in my studio at home, and that's like become my, you know, mantra of things. It's like you're gonna go up, you're gonna go down, but you keep pushing through, and you're gonna come out on the end just fine. Yeah, that, that sounds really cool. It reminds me of the the stages of group dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, have you heard about it before? Yeah. It's um, it goes forming, storming, norming. And performing, Ooh. so forming like, um, and it doesn't have, doesn't have to be a, a group like a company. It could be like a dance thing or sure. new friendships. You know, you you meet, you, you form, and then uh, things are chaotic, storming. So mm -hmm. you're like, okay, well, you, you know, this compatibility is still still being figured out, or maybe different values or visions. Right. And then norming, like, okay, now that we're understanding each other's values, like maybe he or she isn't try, isn't out against me, but they just value something else. You know, and so things are be understood. So that, that's the norming stage. And then performing, everyone's understood and now things come together and things execute. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Your, your, um, the process you just shared reminds me of that where yeah. it's like, you know, identifying that it's not gonna be all roses the whole time. There's gonna be some ugliness, right? There's yeah. gonna be some totally. mental doubt, right? Totally. And then totally. there'll also be a, a breakthrough at the end. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's all part of it. I had one instructor or professor talk about the creative process as like a spiral. It's not really like a, a, a curve, you know, but it's just like this constant spiral where you're kind of like slowing down, but you can keep going and like, but you're constantly, even in the thick of it, still moving up and forward, you know? And I was like, that's a, that's a cool visual way to, to put it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, yeah, great. Th thanks for sharing that. Um, let's talk about voice and identity. You know, I think, um, Besides the creative process, like having originality or having your own style or your signature is very important for every artist. Yeah. As, uh, and uh, you mentioned earlier that you're you're known for the ribbons of light. So mm -hmm. let's talk about like how you found your voice. Um, yeah, just just sure. how how did you get here? <laughs> um, you know, I as far as kind of like what became my signature part piece. Mm -hmm. um, you know the that that style or that type of drawing or like line work that I that I do, um, it actually originated from a very like painful place, um, like in my life, and that drawing was kind of my way of coping and and working through it. Mm. Um, you know, I was in my early thirties and was living in L.A. and was horribly a mess again <laughs> and um you know like pushing through you know coming out of a an abusive relationship um eating disorder in full mode you know like full swing um major depression I was I was like rock bottom probably the bottomest of bottoms that I had ever been in my entire life and drawing these these I was drawing these ribbons as like a 
re like re rehabilitation way or just a meditative way to just try to again like I was saying before like like, like therapy like, like therapy yeah like just how I could just focus on just that let some of the voices quiet down a little bit in the back of my head and it just kind of just try to be okay and when I would draw them they'd always you know the, these ribbons are kind of fluid and flowy and and but when I was drawing them they always had a knot there was like a big knot in the, it was like, a, it was basically like fabric, you know, I was drawing fabrics of just things of movement, you know, and again, that's kind of what I visualize when I hear music mm -hmm. and when I, when I visualize movement is these ribbons. And at that time, when I first started to seek help and get some therapy and some, some care, um, they, they, they pulled dance away from me. They're like, you're not healthy enough to dance. And it was like, <gasps> You know, like, I can't breathe. Like, you know, like, my dance is everything to me. And I was actually at that time, like, overworking out, over dancing, like, you know, not eating and just, just, uh, just, just self destructing, you know, and, um, or self sabotaging. And so for them to say, you can't dance, it was like, I drew this picture of literally like me, like in a box. And this ribbon was like in there with me. And it just kind of like peeked out of this crack of the box. And it was just kind of like trying to get out. Kind of like know? a plant, right? Like Yeah, in a crack, way it yeah. was like a plant, you know, just reaching for the light, you know. And and so these, the, I just kept drawing them. And, but they were always knotted and tangled. And, you know, I ended up moving back to the Bay Area and was in a program and kind of re rebuilding my life again. And, and um, you know, over over about a year or so of, of like rehab and, or not rehab, but just like therapy. And, and I was doing art therapy and all this, all these different programs to try to just get my shit back together. Um, my mom noticed one day I showed her some of the projects and she goes, there's no more knots. And I was like, huh? You know, and I, and I looked and I realized that the lat, like the latter drawings that I had been doing or paintings and stuff, the knots were gone. And it was kind of like an interesting way of me kind of being like, maybe I'm, you know, not so tangled up inside anymore and, you know, finding that light again and finding, you know, some peace and balance in my life. And so it was, it was such an interesting thing that I didn't even, it was like subconsciously it's doing fascinating. this. Yeah. And it was, leave it to mom, you know, to figure it out. And she's like, where'd the knots go? You know, <laughs> and I was just like, oh shit. So that was a whole month long of therapy sessions in that alone, you know, <laughs> like, so what does that really mean? You know, <laughs> how do you feel? How do you feel? <laughs> yeah. But you know, it was, it was, it was it. And I, and so, you know, I have one of the pieces that I drew while I was still like in, in the outpatient program for, for the eating stuff. Um, you know, I have it hanging over our TV in, in our family room as a reminder because that one has like the biggest knot, you know. And so every day I see that piece and I'm like, I see you, you know, but I know that I'm not there anymore, you know. And and so th that ribbon, you know, became a lifeline for me. Those ribbons of light are a lifeline. And, you know, I can always kind of check where I'm at based on how those come out sometimes, you know, and. And you know, for a while, I was kind of like, eh, you know, maybe I, I, you know, started doing more artwork and was more established, like here in the in back in the Bay, and and uh, you know, I was kind of looking to to switch up my artwork or my style or or do some new new things. And and my husband Co, you know, he was like, no, dude, you need to you need to keep going with those. Like they're really dope, and they have you know, they have a deep meaning, and like, but. They, that's that, that's your thing. Like you got to keep doing that. And I'm just like, yeah, but I'm um, keep drawing these. You know, <laughs> he's just like, no, you should keep drawing. And I'm like, okay, you know. <laughs> so and so I did, and they've they've evolved they, even from that point. You know, and you know of having the opportunities of doing you know a few murals and seeing them change an entire space has been really cool because it's like they have. The intention that I have and I that I put in them now are is very different, but you know it's you know like the the piece that I did for um, UCA Capoeira space. Unfortunately, that burnt down during COVID. Um, that piece, you know, it was like they gave me gave me full artist license, do whatever you want, 
you know, you can, we trust you. You do whatever you want. You know, it's family. They were like, we know you, we, you can pull this off. I'm like, 50 foot mural, no problem. I could do this. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but basically they say, we're not going to get in your way. <laughs> yeah, they were just like, we'll, we'll see you on Tuesday, you know, like enjoy the weekend. Yeah. And because I was like, I'm going to do it in four days, you know, and <laughs> it's crazy. But um, the, it that piece, you know, was two ribbons. And it was kind of like the intentions that I saw and visualized was, you know, two people playing capoeira and intertwining. And sometimes it does get a little tangled up when you're, when they're playing the game. And then other times it's really big and expansive and breathy. And, you know, it was, that makes a lot of sense. That's, that's amazing. It was, that was, so that was the story. And, you know, like these pops of color kind of representing some of the music that is also intertwined with it as well within the capoeira. And, and, you know, it, it translated. And so being in that space, when the room was full of people doing capoeira and singing and playing instruments and it was just like the energy of it was just so alive and it was just like like so it's like not every ribbon stands for the same thing you know it's just the the intention behind it that's the important part to me and and you know art is subjective you know it might mean something totally different you know and ironically it was wild because one of the um the mestres uh mestre ha huh, he his, his his name is basically like forest frog or something you know it's like a frog and so that's kind of his symbol and logo and kind of he's he's known for this and within that mural part of it kind of looks like a frog like look like looking up like ready to jump or something and people are like did you plan that? And I was just like, no. <laughs> or yeah. <laughs> hey, I almost maybe. <laughs> but it's like center. And it was just so wild. Like the what are the chances of that happening and people seeing that, you know, and how symbolic it became. And, you know, it was it was pretty wild. But um yeah, I, I that was a long tangent. Sorry. <laughs> that was perfect. That was perfect. Um, but yeah, I mean, those that creating that identity to, to kind of reel it back, um, you know, is, it's, it's a, it's been healing to create that identity. Yeah. With a, a previous guest that came on the show, um, one similarity that from what I hear, or at least from what I understand, um, what you guys are saying about is, you know, reaching a, a, a bottom and going through the process of bringing yourself back up. Right. Or it, it could be a bottom or it could be a setback or it could be a failure. But it's like through those experiences that can't really quantify that has a big impact on how you find your own voice and how you find yourself. Because, you know, from from, from the darkness, you came back, right? And yeah, then like, yeah. what, what else is going to come back besides you from the darkness? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, learned a lot through that one. <laughs> and grateful for, for the artistries and, and, you know, creative things, the outlets that I have, you know, not, not everybody has those, you know, and, and so it may be harder, you know, for someone to pull through with, without those types of things. You know, I'm always like, wait, you don't do, you don't do creative things? Like, what do you do? <laughs> but, you know, then maybe it's something totally different, you know, it's sports or whatever, you know. Yeah, creativity um, can, can definitely be, in my opinion, can definitely be scary for a lot of people who have not uh, like embrace it as much as you have, yeah, you know, yeah. just because like it, it's it's abstract, it's unknown, it's it's not like to uh, a very specific standard. Like for example, if you say what's well, one plus one two, okay, perfect, right? Yeah, you know right. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, so what about uh, how 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 important is is play in your creative process? It, and like where where does that line as far as like emulation, inspiration, or imitation? Um. I think play is important for sure. Yeah. So like what, what I mean is like for me, play is something that I've, I struggle with, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a particular set of my, my mindset where it's like, oh, I'm going to learn this step. For example, if it was dance, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to do it a thousand times and then I'm going to combine these things. So it's like very, it's very, very rigid. Right, um, right. And it's not from a creative approach. It's more like just muscling through it, you know? Yeah. 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 So play is definitely something that's foreign to me. So what, what? How 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 is play utilized in your your world? Well, I think it goes back to the exploration. That's the play for me is figuring out how to use these materials or methods, and you know, like just learning about them. Is that to me? That's me playing. You know, like trying to figure it out, and you know, like okay, that mold didn't work, or 
you know, trying to figure out some sort of animation or something online. I'm like, you know, this is, this is cool, but quite not my bag, you know? And like, that's kind of getting your feet wet in, in different things. I feel like is to me is, is the play. Um, you know, like I feel like, um, I don't necessarily, I'm not the, the type of artist that just will sit down and just be like, okay, I'm just going to knock this out and just wherever, you know, I, I, I think I, I am a little more rigid in that aspect of where I kind of still want and need to have a general idea. And then once I'm like in it, then I'm allowed to kind of like play and, and kind of, well, maybe I could try this or maybe this will work better, especially like with costuming and stuff like, oh, well, you know, maybe the sleeve wants to be more like this instead of what I had initially like seen in my head, you know, and, and so that, that's where the play or the, the looseness of things can, can be allowed within the idea. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But I, I'm I'm fascinated by someone that could just walk in a room and just like knock out something and and be okay with it, you know. And that's that's play, you know. And but I, yeah, I think I still have a little bit more of that OCD aspect where I'm like, no, I need to make sure that this is there. And okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, it's funny, like, I, I've gotten to a point where I appreciate aesthetic so much that if something's slightly off-center, I have to go like, and adjust it. <laughs> <laughs> My stepdad, he, I swear he's got crooked eyes because every frame in our house is is just a little <laughs> off. So I come in and I'll set it back and he'll come in and, hey, who moved the frame? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, this guy, <laughs> you got to fix it. I mean, your head's crooked. <laughs> Uh, what, what are some, some things uh, or some people that inspire you for art or for dance or uh, what what keeps you inspired? And because uh, you know, I, I think for for anybody that goes through life, inspiration is definitely a gift, and then it can easily come, but it can also easily go. You know, and I think mm -hmm. it's really scary when it, it leaves, right? Yeah. So, how do you stay inspired? Um, again, music like music's such a huge part. Of so, so music inspires you. And it translates to like these sculptures or even for architecture or or does music inspire you for life in general? And then you take that energy and apply to other things. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, music is a daily thing for me. I mean, I live with a music producer. Kind of hard not to <laughs> enjoy it because uh, he's working on it all the time. You know? <laughs> um, but I... I feel like our, for the artistic side of things or um, as part of the process, um, you know, like I mentioned movies, certain certain music or certain types of music will really kind of help settle me in. Um, you know, it, it's also, um, what, what I was going to say, like, oh, just even like within costuming and, and from, from the movies and things, like there's certain artists, artists or costume designers that I love to look at um, not even to try to, to emulate in any way, but just, again, just sparks something, you know, and like, man, that's so dope. Like, what, how did they even think of that? And then it just kind of gets my own wheels thinking of, of just creating, you know, and it's, it's hard, it's hard to explain. It's really hard to break down. Would it be fair to say that, um, you have, you have some things that, constantly inspire you, which is being music is like a daily thing. Yeah. And then the other piece is like things that spontaneously you come across that like sparks an idea. Like for example, someone could make a really cool dress, but you're like, okay, that dress makes me want to go make a dragon somehow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this past Halloween, I was in a thrift store and looking at, looking through, through a rack and pulled out this like size 16 it looked like it was like a first grader teacher's halloween dress where someone had hand stitched little patches of all these different um halloween fabrics all together it was like a patchwork dress mm -hmm. and it was huge i was like whoa <laughs> and someone walked by and they're like oh you should get it and i was like i totally am because i instantly saw a totally different idea. I was like, I'm going to make a gown out of this. I want to make a headpiece of candies and, you know, I want to be the Halloween queen. And like, it just was there, you know, it hit me so hard. But then, you know, it's, it's like certain, certain, I, I don't know, like that's things like that will happen as far as being inspired. 
Um, sometimes when I don't have any like main ideas, I'll go through, I have kind of like certain books that I keep on deck, you know, of, of fashion designers like Alexander McQueen. Um, it's a uh, Aiko, I have it down somewhere, Ishi, Ishioka. She actually designed um, the costumes for Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula and uh, J-Lo's The Cell. Like, I don't know if you remember those movies, but like the costuming in that is fanatic. It's just fantastic. Um, so seeing those things, I'm just like, yo, I want to make cool shit, you know? <laughs> and so those, those, those books, I'll just flip through and just kind of get the brain going. Um, what, what do you do when, or if you ever get um, uninspired or a creative block, how do you get across that? A lot of times, I, I definitely don't try to force it. You know, and unless I have some crazy deadline, I'm just like, you know what? Today's not the day. I'm okay with that. I'm going to go skate or I'm going to go dance or, you know, go do something, you know, other than what that is, where that is blocked. And usually I can come back reset, you know, after the fact or other times I'll just, I'll start dialogue, you know, um, with with Cody or you know my my crewmate and and bestie where we have our little we call ourselves the art matrix gang you know and we'll just throw ideas out and just start you know going back and forth and just trying to just get anything out on the on the on the board basically you know and then see what sticks something might stick oh well what if we you know what if you did this and yeah but I don't know and but it could do this you know and those ideas start bouncing and then that kind of helps get through that and then. Just, the trial and error begins, you know, yeah. or the the play, you know, the play begins. So, so like, uh, would it be fair to say that those type of discussions amplify your creativity? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, is there anything else that amplifies your creativity? You know, I, I feel like my environment is a huge part of that, of what amplifies it. Um, you know, like I, I'll keep kind of like the more current works that I've done, like, in my room accessible and in sight. So to kind of help keep that flow of where I'm at and what's going on, um, you know, like the, the artists and things that I have hanging in my studio also inspire me. And, and just being in that, in my special space is, is a, is an important part. I know I'm, I'm more of the type of person who likes to be kind of solo dolo working on my stuff, like when I'm in it and, so that that environment in that room is really important to me, you know, like being out painting a mural in a space where people are coming by, watching, hanging out, like it's really a challenge for me, <laughs> you know. And that kind of stunts the creativity because then that that pressure of these expectations from outer, outer sources is like there, you know, but if I'm in my environment and even if I am stuck, I feel like I can kind of like I'm in my safe zone and I'm like, okay, I'm a, I'll get through this and I can push through. So it's it's yeah it's, it's different for so so like for you it sounds like um, having the right space to do what you want un uninterrupted yeah right that's very important yeah. yeah like Cody will hear my 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 art music playing and he's just like okay bye you know <laughs> <laughs> he knows you know like, what's what's your art music what is that um I mean I it it ranges I'm all over the place but I do kind of have kind of like these moodier stuff I made my list so I would remember um you know there's like floating points alpha mist um sometimes it's like I'll go into like some 90s hip hop stuff but um you know I. I'll even go like to, for some reason, a Sarah McLaughlin album from the 90s. <laughs> uh, you know, Floating Points, I, I, that makes sense, but Sarah McLaughlin, I did not I, see that coming. I'm, I'm, it's so out there. But <laughs> that, like in the 90s, that album actually really made like an impact on me. And so I kind of, it takes me still to this day when I listen to it, it takes me back to that that time and place and it was a very calm place and that, that that album that I listened it's the fumbling towards ecstasy and it's it's kind of a dark album it's it's a trip but you know it's not her uh what, what's that festival she does <laughs> it's it's not it's not it's not super like you yeah, know whatever <laughs> but but it but it's one of those one of those albums that takes me to this to a place same with actually Koflo's Obidumbao album I listened to that one a lot and that one takes me to a place like where I, you know, 
it was a special time when that when he when we released that and the gathering that we had with with all our friends and crew and family to to share that was a, such a special time so like those little memories and things start floating around while I'm like in this room in this space like kind of diving into some projects you know and it's it's kind of cool I don't know yeah <laughs> go Sarah <laughs> You know what? That that uh, answers the question earlier. Fun fact. That was a fun fact right there. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Did you know Amy likes her? Did you know? <laughs> uh, let's, let's talk about business, right? Like what, what are some uh, of your experiences on the business side of having a creative career? And not just architecture, but like with your murals, with um, everything else. Like what can you share about that? I'm horrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so work in progress. <laughs> it's a work in progress. That's a, yeah, it's that's the hardest part of of it. One, I don't do it. I mean, I'm fortunate and grateful that I don't do it as a mode of survival, right? Like I'm not on the grind trying to pump out paintings to sell and slang and, you know, like really on that grind because I do it because it's important to me. It's a release for me. You know, it's it's in ways spiritual for me. Um, so it adding business to it, I'm always just like, eh, I just want people to have it. You know, like I just want to give it away and just, oh, I won't charge you. Don't worry. It's cool. You know, but then everybody's just like, wait, what? You know, <laughs> like maybe you should be charging or maybe you should, you know, at least value your time and your, you know, your efforts or you know an experience and I'm like okay <laughs> so it's a challenge it, it really is um but it's funny because I you know my 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 fr friend that I've been kind of help mentoring and help building her confidence in her own artwork you know she she's kind of in the same place she's just like ah, I don't you know I don't want to I'm only going to charge them 50 bucks you know and I'm like Dude, how many hours did it take you? You know, and I, I'm literally like, you know, telling the same things that I should be telling myself, you know, and I'm like. Sometimes that's just what it takes. Like, like yeah. seeing someone else do what we do and yeah. us telling them, do, and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, I, we, I went to the um, the artist Human, her 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 in-person show um, just just recently, and it was phenomenal. What, and what, what, what artist is that, or what, I got, I'm it's, not familiar with Human. Um, she, she's actually a Bay Area artist. Um, Wait, is it like a musician, or is it like a... No, she's uh, a painter, painter, oh, okay, painter, like fine art painter. Okay. Um, she does murals and, and beautiful, beautiful work, and she's been exploring kind of like, um, there's a term for it, but it's where you can literally put your phone your camera over the artwork and the artwork becomes... Like, oh, is it um, AR art? It's like AR art, yeah. But the painting alone is phenomenal. But then now it's like this bonus thing, you know? And and so I was just like super inspired, super jazzed about seeing the show. Um, and, I, you know, I'm looking at the price tags. And it's just like 15000 20000 I'm like, damn, she really doing this. She's really doing this, you know? And um, it's like bravo you know and then I go home and and here I am telling my friend to, and so I'm like just think human just think human you know we gotta think human prices not that we're gonna charge that price for our, our works but it, the, the idea of having the the confidence and knowing our value for what we're putting into it what what our time is worth you know and yeah you know like don't you know, I can't shortchange myself for, for a project. You know, if I know I'm going to paint a mural that's going to take me four days, like, and I'm, you know, I've got it, that's t four days of my life. I got to, you know, physically and mentally take care of, you know? <laughs> and like, I learned that actually on the, um, the UCA mural, the one that burnt down, you know, like I challenged myself, oh, I'm going to do this for you know whatever price and I'm gonna get it done in three days and I ended up getting like a herniated disc in my neck because I was working so hard to try to do that and I was just like okay that backfired <laughs> you know? like, let's try something different the next round you know and so I learned to one ask for help <laughs> you know to be okay with having people help you know the OCD aspect of my level of you know 
perfection or quality, you know, of work was like, can I trust somebody else picking up a paintbrush and filling in a color for me? Like, I don't know, you know, like the, but those are part of the business aspect as well. Like creating a team, having, having the help so that you can do something efficiently, you know, and that's, that's, it's hard. Yeah. I, I agree with all that. If I were to add anything, it would also be, um, to know who your audience is. Cause, yeah. cause, cause I think like depending on who, who I'm, not, I'm not saying you specifically, but just people in general, you know, depending on who they're surrounded by, like their perception of value for what they do or the, the subject matter at hand could be very, very skewed. Yeah. yeah um, like I, I, I was at, uh, uh, this workshop a few years ago by uh, this guy named Ito Potel, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I don't I don't know if you know who, who that is. Like, Isn't I think he a martial art guy. Uh, he he does he's he's like a generalist, but he's uh, Israeli. He does uh, yeah 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 okay. uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, it was actually me and Scotty there. Actually, oh, it was actually me me and Scotty there, and uh, we both paid like seven hundred for two days, like eight hours each day, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I was there, there was like ninety people in the class, Dang. and I'm like, and uh, but what was interesting was the the wide spectrum of the people in the class. Mm -hmm. So you had some people that was like me and Scotty, younger dancers, movement, just want right. to you know learn. You had like chiropractors, physical therapists. Mm -hmm. You had like gymnasts. You had just like just bodybuilders. You right, know, right? But but the general consensus was um, like the group who was there. Everyone value what was being offered, and so there was no hesitation on like, oh yeah, of course I'm gonna pay so much dollars for right. this thing, you know? Right. Yeah. Whereas like a, a, dem a different different demographic and uh, could easily be like, oh, that's too much money. Right. Why am I gonna do that? So sometimes it helps knowing who your audience was, and Absolutely. and if you're not being valued properly, then maybe that's not your audience, right? Right. Right. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a price tag on on this project for this. I don't know if they'll pay it, you know, and then they come back and they're like, that's it, you know, and you're like, oh, damn, I should have said more, you know, <laughs> and like, and that's kind of where, you know, my learning curve was like trying to figure out the audience and, you know, like what I feel is worth, worth the time and efforts and, yeah. you know, and, and then, yeah, just trying to find those sweet spots or, you know, kind of bracket things. Cause yeah. Yeah. I, I had this one, one, one experience uh, that helped me understand more or help me understand and also be more confident of um, self value is uh, uh, when I got this contract as a, as a as a drone pilot, right? And I was doing these gigs, and then originally I was doing I was knocking these these um, these sites out in like one day, and yeah. then suddenly I was traveling all up down the coast, and it took longer and longer days, you know? Right. And then I was emailing the back like really shy, like hey, um, so it's taking me more days to do this, <laughs> and and then like the number I had in my mind was just a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. Right, but. Uh, some advice I was given: Don't say a number; just let them pick first. You know what I mean? Right. right. So, so I, I I didn't say a number, and they're like, "Yeah, actually, we're you're right. You're working really hard." They gave me like five times what I was going to ask, and I was like, oh. "Right, yeah, you know, you can sell yourself short really, yeah, yeah. really easily." Yeah, it's like, "Oh, I should have. Why did I do that?" You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky. Some lessons learned as far as like red flags uh, over the years that you've you've gotten like, hey, these are the qualities of a, a crappy client or. Oh. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, there's there's the always the oh, you you we you know you'll get free exposure. Oh, you know what? You know, you know what? I it, like I I do photography as well, and you know what I say? I'm already overexposed. <laughs> 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 right, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, go yeah. on. You no, know, I mean it's that just pains me, and you know it's it's the the people that don't stand up and speak out about that that keep letting that be an okay thing, you know. So I, I feel like that is number one real fl you know red flag. You just got to be like, no, nah, I'm not doing this for free. Whether it, for especially, I know it's quite a big thing right now with, within the dance world. You know the whole. Uh, what was it? The halftime dancers didn't get paid or only got paid so much. Oh, at the, that, was it the um, the the Super Bowl, right? Yeah, Super Bowl. Yeah, it was the Super Bowl. But um, yeah, it's just like in 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 anything, you know. It's like, oh, can you design this flyer for me, and I'll give you a free T-shirt. And you're like, yeah, no, <laughs> like that's gonna take me eight hours to do. Like, you know, it's not worth the T-shirt, you know. And yeah, so that that's that's kind of like my biggest just understanding. Your time, 
your your you know the materials that you need you know the the effort that you have to put into it like it's so important to just be able to value all of that and let other people know you know <laughs> um so i i tend to and i had i started to kind of just recommend like even just doing within you know like the fine art world, researching like how much do people charge for a mural or is it by square foot? Is it just by, you know, like a flat price? Is it by the hour? You know, things like that and start kind of just getting, especially like even in graphic design or any of those other types of fields, like what what's really, what's what's the average? You know, where where's the, the right window of, of money? Is it my way off? Am I way, you know, like... I, I value my time and I'm thinking, oh, I need 10000 an hour, you know, like versus realistically I should only be getting so much like, you know, it's researching and kind of seeing that. There, there's, there's this podcast I uh, sometimes check in for entrepreneur creative, creative uh, business ideas or business understandings. Mm -hmm. It's called The, the Future. We'll have an E at the end. The, the Future. future. Future no e yeah yeah the future oh. no e but yeah w one of the things they talk about on that podcast that I think is really applicable to creative artists is, is uh, walking away or steering away from billable hours yeah but, yeah because because billable hours like doesn't really cover uh, um, the full extent of it right, right. and at, at, at the end of the day like say for say for example if Nike came out and it's like hey we need who, whoever designed that Nike logo mm -hmm. say it was like oh yeah there's one person that's like ten thousand one person that's like one million one person's like ten million you know right, right. and then the manager's like okay why am I gonna hand, hi, hire the, the one million guy right right but if if that one thousand dollar guy or girl uh, messes you know mess, messes messes up <laughs> you have you have this this whole line that's now like a waste of money right right yeah so it's so sometimes sometimes it's like okay we're we're, we're having this like hundred million dollar um product line and we need this logo or this graphic design to just kill it right, right. and so it's, it's worth millions to us in that case it's like you know yeah. it's, it's, like, it's like a whole different ballgame than billable hours oh totally yeah totally yeah you're like well it only took me six hours to create the swoosh so yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so give me like hundred bucks hold on wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> what's this big picture like okay <laughs> yeah yeah um uh let's Let's uh, talk about some of the other pieces you brought, um, including, I think one of them has the ribbons of light on it. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can we talk yeah. about that? Yeah. Sure. And put this little guy away. Say bye bye to the camera. Say bye bye. Yeah. So these are my ribbons of light. You, you know what's cool? Like, I, I really like that uh, how you weave the, your different art forms together. Like, you, you skate, but also you like, um, uh, what do you call it? Restored. Yeah, restored the skate, but also the, the um, deck, um, deck design it as well. Yeah, they were just plain white. These are vintage 1950s skates. Um, they're, they're from us, and I. She was a nice. Did, did, skater. did it come with this too? Or no, I added that. That's kind of like a, a signature style for for that type of skate now. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it's the fur tongue. With yeah, the sheep's wool. Um, yeah, it was a. Betty Little was the an ice skater who started her own line of skates back in the fifties, mm -hmm. and um, it's kind of like it, since skating's all the, all the rage again. Yeah, um, they they they're they're fairly popular to to find, but they're all in you know pretty worn condition or been sitting in someone's attic for 40, 50 years, and you know it was just finding some and restoring them was kind of a really fun little project, and and uh, just giving them new life, you know, and. And some sauce. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love it. It, it definitely um, looks so dope. Yeah. Like, let's talk about, a little bit about artistic skating. What what exactly is that? And like, like what are the other forms of skating? If that's if, if you do artistic skating. Um. So artistic skating is very similar to what would you would see on ice, where there's um, there's the dance aspect where they're doing say it's like ballroom. Um, where there's tangos, waltzes, foxtrots, like all those different dances, and there's certain set patterns and steps that you do on the floor. Um, there's more of a freestyle dance, which has got some partner lifts, and and um, also very more more similar to like the the ice skating, partner skating with with the jumps and the lifts and stuff. Um, and then there's, if you ever go to a roller skating rink and you see the circles on the floor and there's sometimes the little swirly ones, those are, it's called figures. 
And that's literally where you're tracing the line, splitting the line between the between the wheels. Oh, really? And you have to trace it, and you're doing different types of turns, so you're going forwards and backwards on those circles, and you have you can't like stray off the line. That's how you get judged. And wow. um, that one's pretty hardcore. <laughs> it takes a lot of patience for that. When you're like 15, you're just like, oh, I have to trace this line, you know? <laughs> like it was it was very challenging. But that was actually one of the the divisions that my mom was was a champ at was tracing those lines. Like she could trace them like nothing. But um, yeah, and then there's there's um, then there's like pairs and like like you see most popularly on on the ice skating is with the big jumps, the triples and jump, you know axles and sow cows and all those big big fancy jumps. Um, so it's all primarily the same. It's I've been learning ice skating for the last two years. I've actually been like taking lessons and because I was always horrible at ice skating and tend to always hurt myself somehow. And so fortunately, my boss's wife is an ice coach. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. So after years and years of me going, I want to take lessons, I finally like we made it happen. And so I've been training and learning. I go I ice skate twice a week and, you know, in the mornings before I go to work. And what's, what's the mechanics of skating or like Artistic, artistic skating and ice skating is is it different because one is on four wheels, one's on a blade. Yeah, I mean, like there are general concepts that are are similar, like outside edges, inside edges, the same kind of turns, um, like one foot or two foot turns, um, jumps, things like that are very are all basically the same, but technique wise, it's very different. Um, like on a roller skate, when you push, you learn to to roll off your toe off that you know, that inside wheel on ice, if you were to roll, you would hit your toe pick and, you know, just flick your foot out. And so you have to learn to use the edge. You have to let the blade do the, the movement for you for the most part, you know, like it's, it's just a matter of, of how and how you're working your foot with and le letting the ice do most of the work. Like if you're doing a spin, you're letting the ice, like the blade take the ice with the wheels, you have to really maneuver it a lot more with your foot and you're really carving with your toes. And so it's very different. So when I, whenever I go ice skate, I'm always like, I have roller brain, brain. So I'm always like, okay, I'm on ice. I'm on ice. Switch, switch channels, you know, and my coach will be like, I know you, you're thinking you got wheels on your feet, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she's like, oh, damn it. <laughs> but I mean, it, ideally it's, 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 so much the so much the same, and just never gained the popularity or became a, an Olympic sport, you know, like like ice skating is. So yeah, are are, are there anything you do in order to still do these activities? Because like you, you you don't just do these activities, but you do it like very fluidly and very freely, right? So like, mm -hmm. how do you maintain your body so you can you can you can do this and and um because I I know it's like the more I sit in the chair, my back gets really tight, my hamstrings yeah. get really tight, you know, yeah. and. Uh, I constantly feel all the time like, am I becoming that person that they just get stiff? You know? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm horrible at stretching, <laughs> like maintaining body maintenance. Um, but so far, I haven't had any major injuries over the years between dance and skating and just all the active things that I do. And um, my body's been fairly agile. I definitely wake up feeling 46 these days. Um, but I'm able to kind of work it out. And like th the increase of skating has actually improved my knees significantly in the last like two years. Like I was having all kinds of knee issues and MCL stuff and and it was it was questioning like maybe I shouldn't be skating because they're the stuff is my knees are messed up, like they're hurting, you know. But then once I kind of got over and started doing a little bit of 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 you know, a regimen of some squats and stuff like that. I just, I feel like my, my quads and my knees are so solid right now. Like I haven't felt this good in my knees since I was probably 18. <laughs> you know, I'm like, let's go. And even dancing and doing floor work and dropping down, nor like normally my knees and quads would just gas out and I just stay down until my set was over. You know? <laughs> now I'm up and back down, up, you know, and it feels great. So I, I encourage people to skate. <laughs> so, like uh, you mentioned something about squats. Like, do you do any like uh, a particular particular uh, style or methodology for squats? Or no, I I don't get too too involved or too you know in, deep into it. Mm -hmm. I 
I would just do some lateral with a band, you know, lateral okay. sides and then just regular squats. I was training pistol squats for a while just so I could do like the sit spin type st movements and stuff. Um, yeah. And that's really hard, but it definitely, it helped increase everything, like all the strength. So anybody, if you can do a pistol squat, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> just be careful because <laughs> they're hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, let, let's, let's talk about those Nikes you brought up. Okay. Yeah, yeah I definitely love uh, both of these, but especially these black ones, though. It's yeah, like, the black and gold. Are you know, like uh, I don't know if I ever told you this, but sometimes, like, as I'm on Instagram and, and when it gets to your page, mm -hmm. I almost feel like it's a sponsored ad because of how, how dope the product is. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You know how, like, Instagram Nike, shows, call me. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. You know how um, Instagram shows you like, product ads, yeah, uh, sponsor, yeah. sponsor ads, right? And you're yeah. like, oh, yeah, I really like this camping gear. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Those actually, uh, Cody was ready to toss those out. And really? Like, yeah, they were just plain black. And oh, 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 before you made it. Before, before I painted them. Okay. Yeah, he was just like, <laughs> yeah, you know, going through a shoe closet and just ready to toss them out. I mean, the soles are, are, are pretty gone. Yeah. And I was like, wait, I'm going to paint these. I'm going to, you know, give them a little more life, you know. So yeah. if you do want to wear them, you could still rock them. But, and, uh, yeah, and then I just had, had thought they would be super fun just doing the gold splatter, and it came out super fun. Yeah, these look so amazing. Like, I can't stop looking at it. <laughs> Send me a pair of black shoes, and I got you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's coming. Yeah. Hey, what, what, what's the story with this one? So these, this was actually, um, it was a, the sneaker is the is the dunk, but it was a, a collab with the, the the designer Sakai. I think is how you pronounce it. S a c c a i Sakai. I think is it. And so it was like a whole line of of the sneakers that they had no laces, and they were just white and the gray. And then I think they they had the the Volt neon color. So I, I was like, ooh, like a no lace shoe would be really fun to paint. Like that would be dope. And so um, when I got these, they were just totally white, only had the gray bottom and the uh, neon or volt color on the inside. And so I matched, color matched and painted all, all the panels and then added the ribbons on them and became my fun spring, summer, high top. <laughs> what, 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 kind of, what kind of markers do you use to um, have this detail and have it like, like stay on and not fade out? I use leather paint. Um, oh, so, so, so it's, not, it's not even paint or markers, it's paint, okay. Yeah, I mean, the the, the, the line work, sometimes I'll, I'll use a mixture of either markers or um, like a India ink and acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. Just use it with a brush and just really like brush in them to, that, that'll, that, that won't go anywhere. Um, tricky thing with, with painting shoes though, or, or, you know, shoes age, even if you're not wearing them, like that's, that's always the hard part. Cause I have a couple other pairs that were super crispy, but just even sitting in the box, you know, they, they start to turn yellow and you're just like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know what? Like I, I, I didn't really realize that shoes do that until, um, I, I didn't wear one of my Nikes for, I think the, the Harachis for a few years. Mm -hmm. And when I did wear it, it had this band in the back that just broke off, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, dude, like that yeah, plastic starts, just- They deteriorate. Yeah. And they just get old bubbles, you know, get all cloudy and gross. They need to put the, the same material that's in the uh, McDonald's burger into these shoes. Because you know how th those burgers do not deteriorate. <laughs> or they're french fries, right? You find a french fry in your car, you're like, dang, this thing's still good. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, five years ago. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Those things are just a fire of nuclear bath. Sure, totally. <laughs> so scary. <laughs> like, yes, let's have a cheap. Like Nike, you need to get some preservatives up in these shoes. <laughs> Backs. Backs. Right. <laughs> totally. Uh since you know, let's let's uh segue into Kofo real quick. Yeah. Uh, since you brought up uh, his shoes. What is it like? Date or not dating because you had to marry. Was it like being with um, another artist as an artist yourself? That because because I you know like there's like okay, say for example, um, an arbitrary couple could be like okay, here's one's one's a musician and one's like a painter, right? But and you guys do have do have different art forms, but you guys also have like shared art forms, which is dance, yeah. music, right? Like what, what is that like? And uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I I I feel like this topic comes up a lot at, for for creatives or for artists or maybe just for people above 30s looking for like um, successful relationship tips. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I, I, um, some of the, I guess, assumptions or maybe stereotypes are like, okay, yeah, 
artists can't date together because it gets convoluted or it gets like messy, you know, yeah. or you got to date someone, someone else. So what's just, just how, how are you guys doing? Cause you guys are doing great. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean the, the dance was our common thread and mm -hmm. that's what brought us together. You know, the club yeah. brought us together for the most part. Um, and you know, as our relationship built, um, you know, he was falling into the, the music world and, and production and learning music instruments and, you know, just totally tunnel vision, like all in for, for that, as well as like Capoeira, which was also a common thread for us. Um, and, and so we, you know, I kind of had you know, and, and also he's, a, he was a software engineer. So it's like, we both had like our engineering day jobs in the most part, for the most part, we had our dance as our common line. We had Capoeira as a common line, but then it was also like, well, you know, you can't spend every minute of the day with someone or else, yeah, you can go, you go stir crazy. So having his music, having my art, you know, was such a great way for us to be able to have our own space and our own thing you know to do but still be fully supported by the each other by each other for those things you know um there was a point where he you know consciously wanted to make the decision to leave the engineering world and and go artist full-time and it was you know that was a big conversation it was like okay well am I gonna be the breadwinner then you know <laughs> like are we gonna be able to do this and make this work and you know we had long conversations about that and you know it was like all right well let's give it a year see how how it works does it pan out can we support ourselves sustainably are you gonna make money am I gonna be paying the bills you know how is this gonna work and and you know it was because he was so dedicated to making it work um you know Kofo is so hard working so hard working like he doesn't stop, he doesn't stop, and he, he's one of those guys that I, I low key feel lazy around. Like, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, even days I'm still in bed. Like, damn, he's already making music. <laughs> you know, but it's it's to me it's it's so. I mean, shit, he keeps me moving. You know, like I'm a little older than he is. You know, and he he certainly keeps me moving with his passion and drive to to do well and be creative and prolific and you know i i want to do the same and hopefully i i do that for him as well you know and so that that's for the most part that's that's kind of what works for us you know is like we can come together we do our things together we have our separate spaces and and, and passions and but can hold each other for for that you know it's it's a beautiful thing i mean i've i've been in relationships where I worked, went to school, had the same same hobbies, like everything. And, you know, it was like being trapped in a bubble. And it was what dragged me down at one point, you know, not to the bottom bottom, but one of the other bottoms, <laughs> you know, like, and it was like, yeah, this isn't going to work. And a lot of times that's why people are, oh, no, I, I'm a dancer. I can't date a dancer. Or I can't do that. You know, I'm like, you can, it may, you got, it can work, you know, and it's just the matter of, you know, how you support each other and how you trust each other. And, you know, if they're all in, you got to be all in, you know. And I mean, I don't agree with everything that he does or says, and he doesn't agree with everything I do and say. So it's not like we're totally like on the same plane all the time, but it still works. You know, there's going to be some sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. have shared opinions, but also like uh, different perspectives. Totally, totally. Yeah. So, it, but, but that kind of helps create you know, the a balance of everything. I, th I think that's really healthy. I, I, I think it's like hell being with somebody who just agrees with everything. You're like, a am I, yeah. <laughs> are, are we alive? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, give me something here. Like, let, let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, if on the outside, what it sounds like is you guys have like different careers that, keep you um, grounded right mm -hmm. and like a shared art form where it's, it's more for like expression and release mm -hmm. and versus like okay you're a full-time dancer he's a full-time dancer and you guys both making money off dance you know yeah 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 I mean we we both I think at some point didn't or made made conscious decisions I think separately that dance wasn't going to be like our full-time focus my full-time focus or his full-time definitely wanted to 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 be you know 
to to make something of it and be acknowledged for it and recognized for it. And you know, we've we've done a lot for the communities, you know, or the Bay Area and and at large to support that. And oh yes, you, you know, guys did. <laughs> so it's like hopefully we get recognized for it. But you know, it's it's because of the love that we both have for that that scene and that 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 world. Um, but yeah. Yeah, you know, like I, I, I definitely support and hope uh, you guys feel good about your contributions. Like you guys have been supportive even when I first met you and you guys didn't really know who I was to the extent I was like now, you know? Mm -hmm. Like uh, there was things that happened in San Diego and you guys came down to support that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you guys didn't have to, but you guys did anyways, right? So mm -hmm. definitely keep doing what you're doing because it's um, having a good impact on people. Thanks. <laughs> we try, <laughs> you know, we definitely try. But, you know, it's it's a it's a good partnership in, you know, supporting each other and believing in each other is that's where where the win is, you know. Mm -hmm. Did did um uh, did the past few years, meaning like the COVID pandemic change uh anything about your artistry? Because I talked to other artists and um depending on whether they're relying on it for money or for dance, mm -hmm. like some people felt like a, a part of it died inside. Like how how did you how, how did you uh survived these past few years? Yeah, you know, the 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 biggest thing that I took away from these last couple of years as far as like survival mode was to be okay with slowing down, you know, because before I was going so hard, like traveling three three weekends out of the month, flying in, going straight to my office, you know, and just back-to-back -back events and, you know, whether it was teaching or judging or, you know, doing just – foundation work like you know it was just I didn't realize how hard I was going and how I was dragging myself through and I was just afraid to say no to anything you know I had to had to take all the opportunities that were coming at me and I was like okay yeah I'm, like, I'm tired but I'm gonna do it you know I'm gonna make it work and and once everything stopped and everything was getting canceled it was just like Skrr, you know and it was just like whoa okay let's take a moment take a breath and just kind of reflect on where I'm at, what I'm doing, you know, like, do I need to take these opportunities? Can I give these opportunities to other people that may need it better or more, you know, and started asking a lot of different questions and, um, and just started to try to realize, okay, well, when things pick back up, you know, be more selective in my choices of, of, of what I'm getting in myself into, um, being okay and not feeling guilty of saying no, which is really hard. <laughs> you know, it's like that, that thing of expectations with some, with other people that they have in you and you're just like, I can't let them down. I, I gotta, you know, I need, I need to make sure I'm there and present and, and representing and this and that. And it's just like, but no, I, I don't feel like I need to do this right now, you know? And, be okay with that and, mm -hmm. and have them be okay with it. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Sorry."> yeah. <laughs> uh, on, on that note, um, how can people best support you? Oh gosh. I don't know. Don't say no. Uh, don't, I know. <laughs> don't say no. Um, how do people, I don't know. Um, you know, enjoy my art, enjoy my dance. And, you know, I've been, I share to share, not for, likes or fame or any of that. I'm not I'm not a TikTok, you know, person or yeah. whatever, but like, or influencer. I'm not trying to be an influencer in any way, but I do like to share like mm -hmm. my passions and loves. And and wh where, where do you share these passions at? Mostly on Instagram. Which, yeah. What's your tag? Um, in, on Instagram, my mostly my dance and skating is on tsunami, tsunami underscore soul shifter and my art and all my art creative stuff is on my tsunami originals it's all one word okay at, at tsunami originals um and yeah i just have the two that you know all my creative stuff is all on the tsunami originals and you know some stuff that i do have available for sale like prints and stuff or on my cartel which is in the link is in my it, Cartel the, meaning like a, a, it's like a, a shopping website? Yeah, shopping website. I, I had a website, but during the pandemic, it got hacked. And I just haven't like, had the energy to redo it. So I set up the shop just to have something. And that, that seems to work okay. Yeah, what about for anyone looking to um, contact you for commissions? Should they contact you on Instagram or that, that um, cartel that you mentioned? Um, I think you can contact 
on the cartel, but the Instagram, my my tsunami originals is is the best place to to contact for sure. So okay, there's that. Holler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some shirts, or jackets, or shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so fi- final closing thoughts for our listeners out there. What would you uh, like to close out with? Um, I actually pulled a quote from an old, old, old ballerina, and I thought I would share it because that's like I have like you know a list of my favorite quotes. So. Who's the Who's the ballerina? Uh, her name was Anna Pavlova. Okay, and she was gosh like turn of the century. She's super old, old, old dancer. But um, it was where there is no heart, there is no art. And I thought that was like, it's it's simple, but it's 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 real. You know, it's like, you know, if knowing you're doing and creating for for the right intentions and for the right, you know, for yourself, and is is so important. And you you know, like you just especially now with social media, just everyone's just out there, just like look at me, look at me, you know. And it's like where where's the heart in that, you know? And so. That I felt I thought that was kind of a cool little quote to to sit on, but um, yeah, you know, I, I feel like as looking back with all the the past lives that I have, um, and to share with with other people, I feel like you know the the biggest takeaway, hopefully, that people can see or can get, or something that I would you know put out there, is you know to kind of the the soul shifters you know, way of, of thinking, you know, is never limit yourself and put yourself in one box, you know, explore everything, explore all the music, all the dance, all the art, you know, like taking in travel is a huge, huge piece of, of being inspired, whether it's, you know, being in a city of, of architecture or, you know, the clubs or, you know, museums or any, you know, you could just sit on a bench and people watch and probably be inspired by something, you know, like something simple, but getting out of, of, you know, your own box or your own comfort zone, I think is so important. And, you know, just set your intentions and kick ass. <laughs> so again, never half ass, only full ass. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been amazing. You're definitely an example of what you just mentioned about not being in one box. I actually like can't even count how many boxes you're in. <laughs> <One> box. <laughs> you know, so I uh, keep on doing what you're doing because it's uh, it's very inspiring. It's leaving an impact, and you know, you're you're someone that I I think about a lot in terms of um, going into different spaces and like just allowing yourself to be in those spaces versus, versus like defining yourself as one thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, again, we, we opened with like, I, I, I knew you as a house dancer, but it's like, it's just a very t- tiny tip tiny of tip. Uh, the world, baby, you know? <laughs> so yeah, definitely keep doing your own thing. And um, I hope you know that you're going to be a, ret- a return guest on the show, oh, you know? There's, there's definitely uh, future episodes. Uh, we got a lot more to talk about, you know, so many topics to cover. For sure. Thank you so much for being on the show. And um, yeah, just... Keep on doing, doing what you're doing. It's very appreciated. Yeah, I appreciate you hearing me out <laughs> or sharing. So yeah. It's an honor to be here. So thank thanks you. so much. Okay. High five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>